Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald at the Heritage in Flight Museum at the Logan County Airport in Lincoln. And if it looks like a barracks, that's because it is. Our McDonough County viewers might recognize this from Camp Ellis. This barracks was taken down after the war, moved here, and until 1984 was the office for the airport. Well, now it houses this museum. This building, a nearby hangar, and some airplanes outside make an interesting visit. Well, we mentioned the fact that, that the museum is in an old barracks, and it's kind of fitting because it's full of military stuff. Um, in fact, back, oh, gee, uh, what, 30, almost 30 years ago, this, this was the office for the airport, and then when they moved out, it became the museum. And when you walk in here, Jack, you look around and you say, well, there must be thousands of military items in here. Where'd they all come from? Well, what happens is, when you're in the military, you always bring home souvenirs. Yeah. So the World War II, Korean, Vietnam vets, they have all of their memorabilia, like I say, in the sock drawer, mm -hmm. you know, for 50, 60, 70 years. The wife doesn't necessarily want it. You know, the kids don't want it. Yeah. So what they do is they bring it out here, donate it to the museum, and they can come and visit it. <laughs> It gives them a chance to get out of the house, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Let's go over here and see an example because I find this kind of interesting. Um, and, and I love the fact that you have stories in here of, of local service men. Yes. And, and this is a perfect example of what you're talking about, this, this uh, wooden right. airplane. Yes. Uh, this gentleman, Stan Paulus, is a Lincoln native. And, and this is his uh, uniform. This is his uniform. Uh, so I decided to say Stan passed away two years ago. Oh, okay. When Stan was in high school at the beginning of World War II, you know, there wasn't such a thing as plastic and, you know, Bakelite, you know, for identification purposes. So the Air Force, Army Air Corps in those days, had high school students carve airplanes like this, and then they could use these. Of course, you know, this isn't World War II, but right. they used these to teach pilots how to identify aircraft. Uh -huh. So they'd say, okay, what's this, you know, F-4? Well, Stan, when he graduated, joined the Air Force, went to Europe, flew 67 missions over Europe, wow. came back, worked for 40 years, retired, started carving aircraft again. As you walk through the museum, you'll see examples of his carving. Oh, gee darn. He was very good, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And we have a picture of him here, too. He's. Uh... He's uh, with some other pilots there, or with a crew. Um, uh, his name was Paulus. Huh? Yeah, Stan Paulus. Stan Paulus from Lincoln, Illinois. Yeah, until Stan started getting a little older, he would come out every Saturday, mow the grass around the museum. Is that right? So he was a very active member. Terrific. Jack, who was Ted Parmenter? Okay, Ted Parmenter was a local uh, gentleman that was a fighter pilot during World War II. Mm -hmm. And on D-Day, uh, Normandy, uh, 1944, he was flying over, strafing actually German troops, and he was shot down over Normandy. Mm -hmm. And of course, Ted bailed out and uh, made it, if you will, and was a prisoner for a while and then escaped. But uh, later on, the farmers were digging in their field and they dug up these pieces. Mm -hmm. And when Ted and his family went back to visit the area, uh, later on, the farmer gave them these pieces of his aircraft. Oh my goodness. And by checking some serial numbers, it actually was his P-38. So they donated these, and the dirt on it is from Normandy, so that might make it kind of interesting. That's fantastic. So he goes, he's in a prisoner of war camp, right? Well, actually, he didn't make it all the way to the camp. Uh, the Germans captured him. The next day, he actually managed to escape, and a French woman helped him escape, and then the underground rescued him and he was brought okay, back. Okay, okay, and then years and years and years later they go back over there and it's kind of a coincidence that his plane is the one that they return to him and he finds out that it actually was his plane. Yes, and uh, <laughs> the lady who had rescued him had passed away by then and so he and his family uh, put a stone up at her gravesite that says August 17th, 1944, you saved my life, merci. 
Well, Captain Paul Million, also of Lincoln, yes. his story uh, after the Battle of the Bulge was not that unusual. I imagine a lot of them were in prisoner of war camps, weren't they? Yes, they were. And uh, I refer to this as my prisoner of war area. And uh, it's hard actually to come by uh, items from a POW, but uh, we did manage to get some. Paul, uh, like I say, was from here. And when he was in a prisoner of war camp, the Serbs were right next door. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they would do is, the Serbs, being very artistic, would actually carve cigarette lighters out of scraps of wood, or cigarette, pardon me, cases, mm -hmm. out of the scraps of wood and bits of metal and glass. Mm -hmm. And then they gave him, they gave these to Paul, wow. and then he managed to bring them home. Whatever they could find to work on, they had a lot of time on their hands, and whatever they could find, they would, uh, they would carve and make make little things. That's his. Yes. Is that his dog tags? Yes. Oh my goodness. And that's a cigarette holder. No, that's a, like a paper holder, maybe, or yes. cigarettes. I'm not sure. Wow. Remember sometime in 1945. Mm hmm Touch it. Jack, Logan County had a lot of heroes, but I don't think anybody more heroic than Lindy Fancher, who survives to this day, doesn't he? Yes, he does. He is uh, the only World War II veteran that still belongs to HIF. Mm -hmm. uh, Lindy now lives in Atlanta, but he lived here all of his life in the Army during World War II. He was in Europe in the Battle of the Bulge, and of the many awards that he received, of course, he was wounded in battle, but uh, he received the Battlefield Commission, received the Silver Star, which is the second highest uh, mm -hmm. ribbon that you can get. Mm -hmm. And he got that for uh, crawling through a minefield uh, about six times, aiding his wounded comrades and repairing telephone lines so that they could have communication. Oh, so he was uh, he was on his belly. I imagine he was uh, he was probably uh, advised not to go in there and, and went anyway. Didn't Undoubtedly, he? Oh. he had a lot of stories. Uh, one that he single-handedly uh, destroyed a German tank by jumping on top, raising the lid, and dropping a hand grenade down inside. And, and this is not just a story. No, no, yeah. this happened. Yeah, you know, and knowing yeah. Lindy, it happened. Mm -hmm. Jack, in the home front room, we're reminded that some of these uh, munitions were made here in central Illinois at Iliopolis. This is exactly right. During World War II, Iliopolis had a very large munitions factory, mm -hmm. and there's still remnants of it to this day. These shells were all made at the plant in Iliopolis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and boy, they weigh a ton. They I mean, really this do. thing, you better, you better be ready to pick up something when that, now yeah. this one's not so bad, but actually you can show us, I think, how this okay. would fit. This would actually go on the end, of course, the powder in this area. Mm -hmm. And this technically is the bullet that comes out of that casing. And this would be shot by a, a tank or? or well, what would, could be uh -huh. a cannon, tank, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that type. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to back up a little bit too because this came. You found this in your travels. In, in your travels, and I love this because this is May of 1945, uh, right around VE time. Right. And this Logan County paper, this is the Courier from Monday, May 7th, 1945, uh, has all of the soldiers that lost their life during World War II. Yes. I believe it or not, I found it in a secondhand shop in Petersburg, Illinois. And it said Lincoln Courier, you know, mm -hmm. VE Day. So I bought the paper. Didn't know this was in it till I got it back here. Oh, what a find. Yes. No kidding. Accidentally. Rick Noggle, we use the term one of a kind and unique. We use those terms all the time. But in this museum, you actually have one, don't you? This engine is, is yes. that. Yes. This here engine was it's built by the Herman's Motors Corporation of Lincoln, Illinois. And it was designed by John Herman from Havana, Illinois. It was designed back in the 19, late 1920s, early 30s. And this engine was actually on a test stand in 1934 running. Wow. Yeah, it is just fascinating. The, the, 
the principles that was used, the, the way it compounded the compression and the fuel injection supercharge, stuff never even heard of in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. The guy was such an innovator, but he was killed in a plane crash before he was ever able to sell the engine. No kidding, and he was killed uh, in uh, what, 1937, and he was trying to sell this to the government. Yes. He was trying to interest yes. them in, in purchasing it, I guess, for aircraft? Right, they, they knew the war in Europe was starting to break out mm -hmm. and how things were going downhill in Europe. And the, he was going back and forth to Washington, D.C., trying to sell this engine concept. And in the, after he had crashed, there was a stockholder um, breakdown you know, because the companies, people trying to decide who was going to run it and so forth, they kind of got in little arguments and mm -hmm. stuff. And the mechanics who actually put the engine together for John actually refused to cooperate with the stockholders. So every time the military came to see the engine run, the mechanics wouldn't fix it so it could run. Oh, and so they, it, they ended up giving up on yeah. it. But I, in the documents that came with the engine, it shows that several times they had tried to see this engine run. Mm -hmm. But the family of Ed Campbell here in Lincoln who passed away donated this to us and fortunately they saved it and it, it, it I heard about this when I was in high school just long-haired young mm -hmm. punk hippie <laughs> and I tried to see this engine clear back then and I was just totally fascinated when I found out that somebody was going to donate it to this museum so I did a nice yeah. nice little restoration on it you sure did it looks yeah. terrific it's wow. a beautiful engine but one of a kind yes it is Jack, if you step outside here at the Heritage and Flight Museum, um, you get the chance to, to take a little walk among many of the airplanes that have been here for, for some time. And of course, then you have a little explanation in some cases about what they are and what they're. But yes. you're fortunate because you have a number of warplanes on loan here. Yes, we do. And uh, as an example, the first aircraft that you see here, the helicopter, is a Huey. And this particular aircraft saw combat in Vietnam. Yeah. Had a little combat uh, damage to it, and then it ended up in Decatur at the uh, Air Guard, and then they, when they were done with it, then we managed to secure it for the museum. Mm -hmm. it, it's always interesting how you come about these planes. Let's move back down one, and we see another Vietnam, uh, another Vietnam bar bird here, and this is the yes. F-4, and, is. and this is an interesting story because, <laughs> you know, I mean, you, you, you never know, do you, unless you yeah. ask. <laughs> uh, another member and I were over at Chinook Air Force Base when they were getting ready to close the base, and uh, we accidentally one day asked the woman in charge, hey, you got any old fighter planes or anything? She said, yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. You know, we have one that we're getting ready to uh, cut up, and we said, hold it. You don't know, cut that plane don't up. Don't cut that plane up, because we could use it. Well, how did you get it here? Well, uh, I made a call to uh, a senator and uh, his office in Washington, and we ended up getting a call back from the colonel in yeah. Pennsylvania, and they sent a Chinook helicopter to us, and uh, we picked it up and brought it back here. Be doggone. Now, it wasn't as easy as it sounds, yeah, yeah. but uh, they uh, they brought it here. But to make a long story short, it was here. The, the military just kind of airlifted it over for they you. They did, huh? and the same thing with the uh, next aircraft that you see, which is the T-33. That aircraft was in the park at Versailles, Versailles Illinois. Mm -hmm and uh, they wanted to get rid of it because at the time it was pretty well beat up. Kids had about destroyed it. And the same gentleman with the helicopter, we had uh, gotten some straps, so we went over there, strapped it, picked it up, and brought it over here. I'll be doggone. So, but probably one of the more interesting aircraft is the one down on the end that you see, the gray one, the 304. This aircraft is a A-7 Corsair, and it was on the USS John F. Kennedy during the start of the uh, Iraqi war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it made the first flight of the war at midnight on the first day of the war started uh -huh. to the outskirts of Baghdad, where uh, the pilot took out anti-aircraft guns on the, on the outskirts of Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, it says on the aircraft, Lieutenant, or C Commander, Blood Driscoll. We got a hold of Blood Driscoll and met him down in Pensacola where he was the lead pilot for the Blue Angels. No kidding. And he said, 
you mean that airplane is still around? <laughs> you know, I figured it would be frying pans by now. <laughs> so it's a very interesting story. It sure is. So it is a combat veteran also. Mm -hmm. Jack, your museum opened in 1984, and then just shortly after that, you acquired your first plane. Yes, and the first plane was the twin beach that you see here, which was a C-45 in Air, Army Air Corps terminology. This aircraft was delivered to the Army Air Corps in 1944, mm -hmm. right at the end of the war. Uh, the only problem was, before it went into service, the war ended, mm -hmm. and so it was put up for sale by the Air Force. and. Uh, the gentleman had it, and it was part of a uh, corporate, we call them corporate jets nowadays. In those days, it was just a corporate airplane, mm -hmm. so it had regular seats in it and everything. Mm -hmm. It was not used as a cargo, but uh, it is a 1944 World War II airplane. Never flew a mission. Never flew a yeah. mission. Well, it's got a nice, easy life now, doesn't it? Ah, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, they actually used him for uh, a bombardier training, gunnery training and uh, of course pilot training for, mm -hmm. for twin engines. So it has a, uh, during the war, it had a very you know, interesting life. Yeah. Not this plane, but the model. You notice it also looks a lot like Amelia Earhart's, except hers was yeah. a Lockheed, and this is a beach. Mm -hmm. Well, Rick Noggle, it's a very short walk from the, the uh, barracks, where part of the museum is in, right across a little walkway to this hangar. Yes. And the museum also has some very interesting displays in here, and we're going to talk about some of the planes that are in here and some of the, the engines that you all have, have, have obtained. But first, it's interesting because because this flight simulator, which is actually a kind of an educational toy for kids, has has been, uh, has you were you were responsible for refurbishing this thing. Yes, huh? yes. What, what did it take? What did it take well, to do? Well, when it was donated to us, it was donated to us as is. And it was built by the EA chapter in Springfield, Illinois, and they actually built it for IDOT, and IDOT would take this around and display it and have kids get in it and stuff, but Is it kept right? breaking down. Uh -huh. So eventually IDOT gave up on it and gave it back to the EEA. Uh -huh. And so they had it in storage, they tried to give it away, nobody really wanted it, and I found out about it and I said, hey, you know, I know a little museum that could take it. Yeah. So I brought it up here and uh, the guys just love it, and I took it, um, last year I took it into the hangar, mm -hmm. totally refurbished it, Went, repainted it, fixed all the broken parts, redone the hydraulic systems, you know, fixed it all up so now the kids can actually sit yeah. in and enjoy it. And, and your grandson Colton is on spring break today, yes. so he's he's ready to go. Yes. Can you can he, you turn it on for him? He can show us how it works. Okay, Colton, <laughs> you ready to fly? Power on. Okay. Or oh, it does. It, I'm going to come over there with you. It yeah. does have the hydraulics, doesn't it? Yes, it has okay. hydraulics. Push the stick forward, it goes down, he pulls mm -hmm. the stick back. And it goes uh -huh, up. If you uh -huh. kick the rudder pedals, it turns. Move the stick left and right, and the wings tilt. Okay. There we go. All right, Colton, let's make that thing fly, huh? Let's make it fly. All right, put that nose up. There you go. <laughs> yes, it's very interesting. You can actually train kids to actually fly an aircraft using Is this. Is that right? Yes, because every function on this functions exactly like a real aircraft. All the components move so you can teach okay. them how, how and, the, and this is called a what? This is an aileron. Aileron. And when okay. he moves his stick, moves your stick left and right, mm -hmm. and the ailerons move. Mm -hmm. They sure do. And I notice that's on the back yep. too. And the rudder components uh -huh. move exactly like a real airplane. So you can yeah. actually train and teach how every part works on the aircraft. Oh, will be darn. Well, well I need that. I need that because functional. I don't know any of that. And you're a pilot yourself, yes, right? Yes, I am a pilot. Okay. And, own, and you're actually in the airplane. business of refurbishing aircraft. Yes. So. Uh, so, so this is perfect for you. Now, would you turn that off for us so yes. we can we'll kill that noise a little bit? Sorry, Colton. <laughs> I know you're having a good time. Just over your left shoulder, one of the things that you all have on, on the wall here is what's called nose art. And I didn't know what nose art was until you told me about it. But, but the pilots liked to decorate their planes, and they liked to customize them, didn't yes, they? Yes, yes. And world, it began back in, well, even in World War I, the aircraft had different different styles, different men would put different decorations on their aircraft. And it was just just a way of building up their nerves and mm -hmm. stuff like that. But a lot of them would put their sweethearts on the sides of their airplanes or the names of their girlfriends or mm -hmm. wives and so forth. And, and this is actual material too, isn't it? That yes. you, I this, mean, that's, that's the real stuff. That, air, that material came off a B-36 bomber bomb bay door <laughs> that, was, that was donated to us. Uh -huh. and, and it, it was deteriorated quite 
quite severely, so uh -huh. we just cut it up and we made these uh, different yeah. pieces out. So they're actually real aircraft metal. Yeah. And, and they're, these are real facsimiles. Yes. They, these are not the, the actual parts of the plane, but, but they're real facsimiles yes, of we, real art. We had several yeah. artists in our group that actually liked the paint and stuff, and mm -hmm. they actually duplicated these from photographs. That is very interesting. Okay, now these two, you'll notice you can't miss these. You've got two aircraft in here. Yes. These are the airworthy ones that the museum owns. And why do you own, uh, I think, a Cessna over yeah, here? This is a Cessna 172. The members, part of being a member of the museum is, you know, it, one of the perks is being able to go out and learn to fly. Mm -hmm. We have instructors that teach you to fly, and these are the aircraft that we fly in. And you can go out, once you learn to fly the airplane, you can actually go out and fly places with your family and friends. Uh -huh. And uh, th this one, 172, is basically for a family aircraft. It holds four people, mm -hmm. and you can fly around and go long distances. Then we have the one, 152. Uh -huh. The 152 is painted in a military scheme, even though it's not a military airplane because we're a museum we thought maybe we ought to put some kind of a military scheme on it but it's actually a trainer it's got two seats so it, you can fly it you know and take a person with you or you, right or you can take you if you're if you're learning you can right. go up with a pilot right. and it, that it's way. really good for an instructor yeah. and because the way the wings are shaped and so forth they're excellent trainers yeah. and, and this helps you fund the museum because yes. obviously there's an expense involved and people pay to fly right. and that way right. you get this is one of our key fundings that we get these are, you also have some vehicles in here from, I, I think, Korea. Yes, this is a Korean, uh, what's called a weapons carrier. This would carry your ammo and your machines and pull a cannon and so forth mm -hmm. in a combat zone. This one here is actually an Air Force. It's got what's called a hard cab, so we know it's an Air Force truck. And this one here had been used on an air base. Mm -hmm. and probably would have carried ordnance to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Now, you did us a favor. You, you, you had this back in the maintenance area and you pulled it out into the exhibit area for us. And uh, why was why was this really an important thing to show us today? Well, this here is one of the earliest jet engines used in American jet aircraft. This was used in the earlier version of the P-80 and the uh, T-33s. This is actually out of a T-33 trainer. Mm -hmm. But this is what the earliest jet engines look like from right after World War II. Mm -hmm. Well, you got some work to do on yeah. this one, don't yeah. you? Yeah, this engine actually is a runnable engine, which is nice, but it needs a restoration, and we will restore it so it looks cosmetically at least like a new engine. One of the first jet engines. Yes, it is. it's that. very rare. Mm -hmm. And, of course, here's another, uh, this, uh, I guess, a Korea Korean, era Jeep. Yeah, Korean vintage Jeep uh -huh. that was donated to us, and it runs, mm -hmm. and we drive it around during the air shows and so mm -hmm. forth. And speaking of old, You've got a story behind this General Electric engine here, don't yes, you? Yes, this, this turboprop engine, is we got it, it was donated to us by the University of Illinois, and uh, we just thought it was just a regular old engine, and then when we started doing the research on it, we found out it's probably the oldest turboprop engine in the United States, that it, it actually predates uh, World War II. It's ma it was manufactured between 1936 and 1940. Mm -hmm. And, and you know that because you contacted General Electric, who, who made this. Yeah. They didn't have any record of anything right. like they this. Actually, That's not ours, they said. Yeah, they actually <laughs> said, yeah, they said it was not theirs, but it has the General Electric's data plate. And the data plate clearly on it says it was manufactured in Schenectady, New York. Mm -hmm. So General Electric said that meant it had to be made in the 1930s because during the war going on in Europe, they moved their operations inland to Lynn, mm -hmm. New York. You know, so they said if it was built in Schenectady, it's a 1930s engine. So it predates what they got in their own museum. It, and they had no record of it. Right. It just no got record. away from them somehow. Right. <laughs> they actually contacted retirees to find out mm -hmm. about it. I'll be doggone. So it's, it's really interesting. Even the tailpipe says for test purposes only on it. Mm -hmm. So it was only in the testing stages. And it was actually designed for the Navy to be used in a ship. No kidding. Yeah, not an airplane. It was designed off steam turbine technology. The Heritage and Flight Museum recently got some good news. It received a $112,000 grant from the state of Illinois for renovation and upkeep. The museum is open Saturdays from 10 to 2 or by appointment. Donations are gladly accepted. With another Illinois Story in Lincoln, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you.
For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.